before I start, I want to you to read with me two passages of scripture. I'll ask the media team they could put it up for me. Firstly, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, and then Isaiah 55 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, and Isaiah 55 verse 11. God gave me a, a word in a few, I'll say, yeah, about two weeks ago. And the Lord told me, when I give you a word, and it's not just for me, it's for, for, and for all of us, when I give you something to tell me, to tell others, to tell my people, don't worry about if you know, they're going to understand it, or you know, if they're going to receive it, or if it's going to sound good, or if it's going to sound proper. And he gave me these two verses. And he said, whenever you deliver the word, declare my word first what I've said about my word over the people, over the hearers, and the word will accomplish that which I want. It has nothing to do with you. You are just the vessel. So I want you to stand with me because this word is for you and me. And we're going to declare what God expects of his word over our lives, over our ears, over our spirits this morning. As we read together, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, and he says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Isaiah 55 and verse 11, it says, so, well, let's read, let's read, sorry, let's read um, 10, and, 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and make it it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereon, whereto I sent it. And that is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And we believe in God today that his word will accomplish that which he had sent it forth to do today. Amen? In Jesus' name. I want to talk to you this morning about first and the last. And we know he who is the first and the last, the Lord Jesus. And he's the one who's going to conclude the sermon today. But I just want, as this is the last day, of 2017 and it's the last day on a Sunday and of course we want to capitalize on that it's the last day of the year it's a Sunday a day when we come before God to, to praise him and to hear from him what better way to to end the year than on the Lord's day and to say God what are you saying to me today as I end the year and go in to a new year. But the, the end of the year and the beginning of the year, these are first and last issues, yeah? So we, as we end one, we begin the other. It's the last day of 2007, and immediately, in the twinkling of an eye, it is the first day of 2018. But humans, you know, you know God ministered to us in seasons, yeah? And we think we can bear a lot, but we are, we are really seasonal. That's why the Christmas season, and we can't stay in the Christmas season forever because sometimes as soon as Christmas finishes and you get your toys, you don't start looking where you can get for the new year. We are very seasonal. Yeah? God says, My spirit shall not always thrive with men 
because he too is flesh. So our spirit, yes, yes, but our flesh, you know, we always want something new. I mean, one suit of clothes could do you know, but you want more. And some of us, you have more than you can wear. If you, you have more than you can wear one every year. Yeah? So we just, no, we don't like to stick to the same thing. And we, in our seasonality, you know, we, first and last, is, is always something that, you know, it's, it's a, an obsession, if I could put it that way, that we have sometimes, this first and last. You know, we have this, you know, predisposition to be the first. How many are like that? You know, man, we, the, the, the nation's bad. We were the first to get an astronaut on the moon. Yeah? We were the first to do this. The first to reach the top of Mount Everest. The first to reach Antarctica. We put ourselves in danger to be the first to brag that we are the first. Homer, how about the first? I was the first to see it. I was the first to see him. I was the first to see the new movie. Yeah? Devices. How many of you wash? They, they have wash when the new iPhone comes out. Or Samsung. I was in Puerto Rico once and the taxi man was supposed to pick me up. And he was late. And he told me, sorry I was late, but I had to get the new the iPhone. No, no, sorry. Samsung 6 was coming out at that time. He said, I had to get, you know, today was the first. They, they were releasing Samsung 6, and I had to get one. And the line was long, but I mean I must get one first. And so I said, wow. you could get it tomorrow. I say, yeah. But I won't get one first. You know, we have this thing. I, I must be the first. I once heard of a man, somebody told me of a man, he's, he's so obsessed with being first. He's the first to get this phone in Antigua. And if he hears somebody else have it, he, he give it away. I say, I want to know that man. Because I got to stand close to him. As soon as he hears somebody, say, okay, right here. How many of you watch, want to be the first to have a flat screen TV when it costs five and six thousand? Yeah? You can get them now for how much? Hundreds. If you go Black, Black Friday, you can get some for under 100 US. Yeah? But we have this thing that we love the first. And similarly, we, we the last. You know? The last. And the last. Um, particularly when it's work. You know? You like to be the last. It's okay, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait for last. Yeah? Or sometimes, if you, you think more food is going to be there when you come last, you say, go right ahead, I'll wait for last. But woe be unto you if all the food run out. You know, so it has, it, it's good sometimes to wait for the last. And uh, have you ever been to Kentucky when it's the last and you get extra piece? Nobody all don't shop. I, I'm not a Kentucky man, but I went to buy something for somebody and I went late. And it was last, and they give me an extra piece. Because I was the last. So it has its, its benefits. But we have this obsession with you know, the first and the last. If you know that this is, this is, how many of you wanted to see Hussein's last race? Or Muhammad Ali's last fight? You know, we have this thing, first and last. It's, an obsession. And so it is that when it comes to the end of the year, we know it's the last, but we are anxious for the first of the year. What is going to happen? The first of the year. I want to be the first to do this. The first, the, the last couple of weeks, there have been lots of talk about you know, the last and the last and the last and the last. Until today is the very last. Can't go no. Tonight we'll have the last minute and the last second. But we're in the last, definitely. But I'm sure as soon as 2018 opens, you know, we, it's going to be a, 
I rush to the first, you know, the first party, the first whatever. First. So it drives us. But today, I want to, to bring the last, because today we talk about the last, the last into some perspective. To help us to, to check ourselves, you see, that which I'm thinking about, the last and the first, is it really what God wants? Is it what God is saying? How many of you uh, put somebody first? If this person, you esteem this person highly, you give them first place. Yeah? And if somebody that I don't know you, I don't think you're worth anything, last. That's how we function. The first and the last. But as I said at the beginning, there's only one first and last. Jesus says, I am the first. I am Alpha, I am Omega. The beginning, the end, the first, and the last. And I said that if you're in him, if you're in the first and the last, then you don't have to rush and, and worry and, and say, am I going to be first? Or, am, am I going to be last? And um, I want to be first. I want to be last. I, I, don't, I want to be the last person to leave, the last person to see. And I'm sure that you came here this morning to say, Lord, what are your last words to us today? This last day of 2017, what is it that you're saying to us. I know if you're in the world, I, I suppose it would be a good thing for you to say, well, let's end 2017 with a bang. Yeah? Let's go out with a bang. Let's party and fete and have a good time as we close out this year. Yeah, that's, that, that's probably a way to to pump up your spirits and to make you feel good. But I want to tell you, this last year, these last moments, these last hours of 2017, if you are a, bel a believer, if you are here, because I want to hear something from God. I want to get a focus. I want to get a perspective. I want to get a direction. God, what are you saying to me? Then... You're in the right place because I have that word for you today. And if I could put it in, in words as to what God, what you want to hear, if I could put it, verbalize it, maybe the thoughts that you have and say, God, what is it that, that I need today? I would tell you that God is saying to you today that he has a last word for you today that will give you a lasting lesson that will leave an everlasting impact on your life. That is what we need. We need a word from God that will give us a lasting lesson, something that I will hold on to from 2017 that will impact my life forever, everlasting. Because the party, as soon as 2018, the, the, the pleasure, the sting, the novelty will be gone. And you're going to say, what next? And if that is what you're looking for, I'm looking for, for one party, the next party is better than the next, and the next, and the next, whatever is better than the next. And you, you, you're starting the year, or you're ending the year with 
a wrong perspective of what the new year should be. But if you're saying, God, I need something. And this is where God is. God is not just going to give you something that is going to last you for tomorrow. God wants to give you something that's going to last you forever because we are eternal creatures. Some people don't believe it, but I believe it, and I'm sure you do too. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, we are eternal. We were made to live forever. And if you don't want to live forever, you will surely die forever. Eternal death. It is not a state where you don't exist. It is a state that you exist and you know a state of regret to know that I had the opportunity to lay hold on life and I squandered it. We are eternal creatures. I said to you, well, if you don't believe that we are eternal, that there is an everlasting life to come, that if you're saved, you're even now living, if you don't believe that, well, then yes. Get all you can, live all you can, acquire all you can, steal, rob, kill, ride the wave until it falls, and then the next one, yes, do that, if there is no everlasting life. But if there is, as Moses would say, number your days, in Psalms 90, number your days, that you may apply your heart on to wisdom. Yes, we are eternal. And there is a word that God is saying to us, to the world, about how we ought to live. If there is eternal life, how are we then to live now? I like the way Peter puts it in 2 Peter chapter 3. You see, this thing that we see nowadays where everybody talking about, oh, no, there's no God and God not coming back. He didn't start now. He's not in our time. He's been around for centuries. I mean, maybe it's a millennia been around for millennia, and in 2 Peter chapter 3, hear what Peter says. This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remember. That's what I want to do this morning, to stir you up a little to remember. Next verse that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the Lord, by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus, the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own loss, and saying, where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation for this they are willingly they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There will be perdition and judgment of ungodly men. Next verse. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as 
a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens that pass away shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. So, that's the last verse we're going to read. Verse 4, I'm coming to it. Things are going to happen. Some, some debate as to whether this fire is literal fire from heaven or maybe it's some nuclear disaster. I don't know. But something is coming. But it says in verse 14, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, and blameless. Your conversation. Next verse. Let's read the last verse. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. The long suffering of God is salvation. If all these things are going to happen, what kind of people are we to be? The way we live, conversation speaks of our way of life, how we behave, how we act. You don't, we just don't act anyhow. Because there is a reckoning coming. So, what then? Would God say to us this last day? I want to tell you, this might, might shock you. So if you're looking for some great revelatory word, I want to tell you that what God has spoken to you for the year, he has spoken already. We would really love to get some, some great word this morning, but I tell you, we can't handle it, you know. If God was to come and say, I want this, I want you to do this, the first thing would say, God, no. 364 days, and he waited until this last one to tell us, oh, we don't have enough time, we don't this, we don't this. So God has been speaking. So don't look for him to say something you know, because you're probably going to tell him, I can't do that. But he has been speaking. He has been telling us that which... He wants over and over and over. Yes, a new year is, new year is coming, and we want new newness, uh, a, a new focus, uh, a new vision, a new direction. You need those when the one that you're on is wrong. But I want to tell you, if you are serving God, you're already on the right direction. You already have the right focus. Yeah? You already have the right purpose. You need now to put it into action. And so the words which God has been speaking throughout the year, God is saying, I want you now to remember them and put them all together so that you can be prepared for tomorrow. The words that I've spoken to you through this year concerning my, my peace and, and my promise, yes, and my love for you, these words that I've spoken to you, I want you to hold on to them and let them be a part of you. But how we are, sometimes we hear a word when God speaks, if we don't like what, how it sounds, if it doesn't appeal to me, if it's not telling me what I want to hear, we reject it. Yet we still expect God to tell us something that is going to, you know, revolutionize our tomorrow. We have to, when God speaks, 
takes, take the words that he says to us seriously and apply them. Apply our hearts to wisdom. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. We know that. It says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, saith the Lord. It's thoughts of peace and not of evil. It's there. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I know the thoughts. You know, you know what the, the thought, what that means? I know the intentions. I know the plans that I have for you. They are good plans of peace. And peace is not just speaking about no war. It's talking about well-being. Well-being in your mind and body and, and have health. That is what he's speaking about when he says peace. And not of evil to give you an expected end to give you that which you have been desiring, that expected end, that something that you've been longing for. Yes, and I know as soon as we hear the desire and the longing and, and plans, we think of prosperity. Yes, Third John says, I wish above John, John told the building, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospered. And we run with that. Because, Christy, we get excited when he will prosperity and blessing and, and finances. You see, those things seem to tickle us. If the word seems restrictive, if the word seems it's going to hold me back, we don't want to hear it. But God is saying, my word, the word that I've spoken to you, is a part of my whole counsel. You, you can't take some and leave some because it's going to leave you. Your, your development is going to be patchy. Those of you who have, have, have little children, I'm sure you know, you try to make sure that as they eat, they get balanced meals. Sometimes you overbalance it too. So we want to make sure that, that nothing is short, that we give them too much sometimes. And when they, they have to, to, to start, um, find ways for them, for make them, to make them lose weight. Cut down. Because you want your child to be the best, to, to think the best, to, to run and, and be able to compete. And when they don't want to eat it, what do you do? It is okay. All right. Okay. Whenever you're ready, you don't do that. You force it down their throat. Is not the truth. Anybody tell, tell the child, okay, honey, whenever you're ready, you come. What parent does that? Somebody tell me. They can say they have two big children. That's how they got so big. Huh? When they don't eat, what do you do? You put, when they say they don't like it, what do you do? They have to eat it. Because you know it's going to benefit them. Yeah? Where's Jovi? Jovi, need bigger than you. The one you think you got, if your daddy just allow you to do what you like and eat what you want and when you want, you think you'll reach there? You think your brain will be developed and you'll be teaching other people's children? No. Why then do you want, when God is giving you something, you want to pick and choose? God, I don't want that. I don't like the sound of that. Because in the back of our mind, we already decide how we want to structure our life and our development. God is saying, I've spoken to you over and over through 2017, and I want to tell you today that all that I've spoken to you is because I have good intentions for you, because I love you. Sometimes we get carried away with love, and we think, oh, well, God loves us, hence, he will not say anything to hurt us. Well, not so much to hurt us, to hurt our feelings. Yeah? We like that. God never said anything to hurt my feelings. As soon as something and we get a little offended, uh, you're, you're, you're talking me, you're judging me, you're pulling me down. 
He whom the Lord loveth, he does what? Chasten it. So don't get carried away when I say God. God loves us unconditionally. And it is because of that love that we are here today. Because he has been given us word, food, that will be preparing us unto this day and for tomorrow. He has good intentions. Those of you who are old school, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've heard it, that when the young man comes visiting, the father would ask him, what are your intentions towards my daughter? Any of you ever heard that? You ever got those words, Deacon Southwell? No, no, not in this age. You, you young. Deacon Charles, you ever got those words? No comment. <laughs> you might not have gotten it in so nicely. Yeah? But in some form or the other, they wonder, what are your intentions? Are you here just to have a fling and a good time with my daughter, or do you intend to marry her? And I'm sure those of you who have children and have daughters, you're not going to make no young mothers come around and play around and just have a good time. Is your friend, have a good time. No, 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 no. Hey, before you go, what are your intentions? Why are you here? Why are you going over my daughter? I dare any one of you fathers to tell me that's not what you're going to do or that's what you've been doing. Because you want intentions are very important. Of course, some of them, you still have to discern the spirit because they will lie to you and tell you, sir, yes, I love your daughter daily, and so whatever it is that I can do to show you and to prove, you know, my, my, my faithfulness and my genuineness or whatever word you might come up with. Sometimes they lie. You know what's in your heart. But I want to tell you something about Jesus. His intentions are honorable. Always. Jesus did not come. He did not come just to have a good time, just to check you out, just to play with the emotions and then drop you. His intention is, well, are and have always been to do you good because he loves you. Put up Romans chapter 5 for me. And verse 6. That tells us. See, John 3, 16, yeah, that is, that is universal. But here what John, Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Next verse. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. People don't die for people, no matter how good you are. They don't do it. They will say they're going to do it, and you accept that they say they're going to do it. You even expect them to do it, but at the back of your mind, you, you know, look, people always take care of themselves first. Some people just don't die for people. So if you're listening to a love song that, that's fooling you, and getting you all emotionally high. You know, I love you forever. I'll die for you. I will travel land and sea. I'll bring the moon for you to prove you to you that I love you. All those things fill in your head with all sorts of unrealistic expectations. And then, when the bomb is dropped, and you realize, hey, you can't do that. You go to the next one, and he makes the same promises, and you go cycles and cycles of relationship because some of the things they promise they cannot deliver. But people don't die for people. But it says, God commended, the next verse, his love toward us. And that word commend means he demonstrated. He exhibited his love toward us in that 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, his intentions, he not only spoke them, he not only said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he died. He didn't put his money where his mouth is. He put his life. His life he put on the line to demonstrate to us how much he loved us. So his intentions to us are, are good to give us an expected end to give us that which we are longing for. You know, sometimes we don't even know what we're longing for. You know? We think we know what we're longing for. Yeah? We long for a good job. That's good. Good to have a good job. A good husband, good wife, a good home. We long for peace. We long, we long for world peace. You know, that's, that's, that's a big line. When you want to see in a pageant, you must say, I pray for this, I want that, and you must end with world peace. It sounds good. Sometimes we don't even know, we, we just repeat it, we don't even know really what we long. We know, we, do you know what man really longed for? David did it best when he says, Lord, thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. We were created to worship God, to serve God, to love God. And all that longing that you have, it is for God. Sometimes we just don't know it. We try to fill it with other things. But I want to tell you the love. When you, have, you get a hold of the love of God, of Jesus. That expected end, that thing that you're longing for, you are going to see it. You're going to realize it is possible that I can be happy. It is possible that my life has meaning and not dependent on the things that are around me, what I have or don't have. But because I have Jesus and I know he loves me and I have his love, oh, I am satisfied. The woman at the well, John chapter 4, we know the story well. And she was longing for something. She was longing for a, a drink of water. She was longing for something that will satisfy, not just a little dryness in the throat, but will satisfy something deep inside that five men could not satisfy. That is what is really happened, what's happening to the woman. She has been through, well, on her six now. She has been through five men trying to find something that will satisfy. I watch, I like to watch this, this uh, program on television named Snapped. True, they, they tell you about True circumstances. It's not a real life, um, we call them true to life thing. This is real. Actual events that happen. With these women, this, for some reason, they snap and they kill their husband. And I was watching one, and this man went and married this woman that has been married five or six times. Five or six times. And then she killed him. And my first thought was, I didn't, I didn't want to know why she killed him. I just said, say, why he marry her? I said, he has to be suicidal. Because if you know that this woman was married seven, six times, what makes you think you will make a difference? I would stay far. I can't satisfy this woman. But he thought he could. Well, maybe he did, because he, he did it with his life. I don't know. But this woman at the well, five men, six men that we know of recorded, and she was not satisfied. 
when she met Jesus. And, and he told her about the water. And, he, and if you know, she didn't drink one drop of water, you know. Not one drop of water she drank. But she left his presence. And she went back to the village and she said, Come meet a man. And I can imagine those people. We, we know we can say hallelujah and glory because we, 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 are, we are reading, we're looking on, and we can see, and we know the end. But those people weren't so forgiving and so receiving. Another man now. <laughs> You're not tired. That is what I, I, I believe. She took the risk to expose herself like that to the ridicule, but she said, come meet a man that told me everything I did. When, when she said, is not this the Christ? I believe that spark. Okay, no, no, this is not our no argument. You're talking about the Messiah. We have to see who this man is. But that is what Jesus does. <laughs> when he satisfies you and you tell others about him and they know what you've been through. <laughs> that is why when, when we sing that song, no one knows. Like I know what he's done for me. That's why I praise him the way I, nobody knows. You know what you've been longing for. You know that which you, you've been craving. And when you come in touch with Jesus, he satisfies. Song says, you know that, that old song? Like the woman at the well, I was seeking. For things that could not satisfy. But then I heard the Savior calling, I'm making it up, draw from my well that never shall one dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. That's what Jesus does. Any of you have, have had that satisfaction? <laughs> huh? Have your cup filled, <laughs> fed, till you want no more? Sometimes people don't understand you, you know. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to understand you and they say, look, I'm happy. I'm happy single. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to understand and say, I'm happy with this job. You can make more. If you're in the States, they want people like you. He said, no, 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 I'm happy. I'm satisfied. My longing, maybe your longing is to be a millionaire. I see millions. I see how I could get millions. But I don't long for it. My longing is Jesus. And when I have him, I am satisfied. That is what the love of Jesus can do for us. <laughs> I like the way Paul says, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. If you can put that up for me. It says, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. That is satisfaction. Filled with the fullness. You can't get any fuller than that. You're filled with the fullness of God. Satisfied beyond measure. I want to tell you, church, God loves us. His intention is to show us with his love individually I want to tell you also God has been telling us this year 
that and showing us that he loves Antigua and Barbuda. I am, I love Antigua and Barbuda. I was born here. I love living here. I've had opportunities presented to me to go elsewhere. But I love Antigua. And I believe that God loves Antigua and Barbuda. But this year, this year, I'm convinced beyond doubt that God loves this little nation of Antigua and Barbuda. September. I still remember September 5th, 1995. I remember that. Because my housework went. But didn't get any damage 2017, but I will not forget. You're talking about not two, two past us, but there are three storms or more this year that were catastrophic, that had death written on them. They, they gave them names, but I'm, when I look at them, I didn't see them. I saw death. They had death written on them. And then when Antigua was targeted and lined up like a sniper, I'm going to take you out this time. You see, when God, you remember early in the year, God has been teaching us about standing on the wall. Anybody remember? And standing on the gap, and standing in the gap. And that God is looking for a man. To make up the heads. Any of you remember those, those words? Or you just pass through your ear and go the next. Those are serious. Those are words of preparation. So when Irma and Maria came to destroy us, I'm telling you, God looked. God looked for a man. God looked for a woman. God looked for a family that were praying. And I want to tell you, God found. God found some in this house, and he found some in another, in another house. And he found them throughout Antigua and Barbuda. And he spared us. I don't know why God did it. Because even our righteousness, the, the scripture says, are as filthy rags. But God loved us. I don't know why God loved Jacob and hated Esau. I don't know. Why God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I will have... I don't know, but I know for sure now that God loves this nation. And I'm going to take that with me today, going into next year, that God loves this nation. And if God loves this nation, I am going to serve God. I'm going to continue to pray and intercede for this nation because sin is a reproach, but righteousness exalts the nation. And we have to see that, that God loves us. And I want to tell you, there are more than 10 righteous people in Antigua. Yes, there are more than 10 righteous people. Genesis, I mean Genesis Chapter, chapter 18, yes, in Genesis chapter 18, when the, the God himself came down and to tell Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child. And as they were leaving, you know, just the last words they had to Sarah was Sarah laughed. She didn't really laugh out loud. She said, no, I didn't laugh. And the, God said, yes, you did laugh. But she didn't know that God could see all things. So he said, you did laugh. And he just left it at that. But they set their eyes. God set his eyes towards Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy. And he, and he, he said within himself, shall I not tell Abraham that which I'm about to do? Seeing that his nation... Uh, from him, he will be the father of a great nation. And 
This is the man I can trust because I know that he will command his children to serve me. Shall I not tell him what I'm about to do? That I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And Abraham inter interceded and said, God, if you find 50 righteous, will you destroy? And he said, no, I wouldn't destroy. He said, Lord, hear me out. How old if five less? How about 45 will you destroy? He said, no, I wouldn't destroy for 45. And he said, don't think I'm disgusting God, but if you find 40, will you destroy it? And he said, no, Abraham, I wouldn't destroy it for 40. Abraham realized, Abraham knew Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why he, he keeps bringing it down. And, and he keeps saying, God, forgive me. I don't really want to push it, but how about if you find 30? He said, Moses, um, Abraham, if you find 30, I will spare. Okay, God, but now hear me out. How about if you find 20? I wouldn't destroy it, Abraham. Okay, God, don't say I'm pushing it. I'm not really pushing it, but how about 10? Say, Moses, sorry, Abraham, if you find 10, I wouldn't destroy. And the argument finished there. That was the end of the discussion. They left Moses and Abraham and went on their way, and we know what happened after that. 10 righteous they couldn't find. And I'm telling you, God found more than 10 because he spared us. And I want to say, to tell you, God loves us. And we need to dedicate ourselves. Say, God, you love us so much. <laughs> I mean, we have, we, we have done so much evil and, and wrong. And, and people, we ourselves say, God, we deserve judgment. But God, you're merciful. That tells me you find more than 10. And so be our desire, so we're going to increase those numbers. Lord, I'm going to live a life that when you look upon me, I'm going to add to the number. That when the enemy should stand up again to want to destroy Antigua, he's going to not just find 50, he's going to find 100. He's going to find thousands who are serving him in this nation. Sometimes we like to say judgment is coming. And when we think about judgment, you know who we look at? We look at the unsaved. We say, oh, judgment is going to come. Prime Minister, leading the country down a wrong road. He's not safe. What do you think he's going to do? You think the Prime Minister is here to promote righteousness? He's not going to promote righteousness. He's doing the job that he knows best how to do. It is us. When, when judgment cometh, God speaks to us, his people, and tells us what we ought to do. To pray, to intercede. When God would destroy the world, in Genesis chapter 6, it says, When God says, I'm going to destroy mankind, they're just too wicked, they're too evil, I can't find no righteous people there. In, I think it's verse 8, this Bible says, Noah found grace, Noah found favor, God's mercy was extended to Noah. So much so, so that in chapter 1 of verse 7, God said that I found righteousness in you, Noah. Oh, God loves us. God loves Antigua and Barbuda. And I want to challenge all of us as we prepare to go into 2018. God, I'm going to promote righteousness. God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do, do the best from me. And we had to point the finger. You need to be righteous. You need to be righteous. You need to point the finger and say, God, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to take your word. I'm going to apply it to my life. That God, when you come and the enemy points the finger of accusation, God, you can say, have you considered my servant? Because God loves us. God has been prepared. It's, not, it's no accident. We didn't escape by a fluke because God has been speaking about intercession and standing in the gap. And it, our salvation didn't come on, 
on the 5th of September, or when Irma came and when Maria came. It came before that. Because we decided that we're going to serve God. Yes. God gave us the word, closing in a moment, for this year, that we're going to go forward. That's the word he gave. Go forward. I know maybe it's not a word that all of us wanted to hear, but that was God, what God wanted. To go forward. Not forgetting 2016. Even though some day maybe it's good to forget because Paul says in Philippians 3, this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, I press forward to the mark of the high calling in God. So we need to forget the behind things. You're not going to forget everything, but there's some things which are just behind. 2017, God says, go forward. Some of us were stuck in 2014 and 2012. Maybe some of us are all the way back in the 90s. I tell you this. If that word was nonsense to you, 2018 doesn't make no sense to you because you have not grasped and embraced the word that God has given. God is saying to you, to us, to me today, that which I have I've spoken to you, I want you to listen. I want you to take it as my word and feed on it and meditate on it and let it become a part of you because that was the word preparing you for tomorrow. It might not be there in the past physically but your spirit is stuck there your spirit is stuck on, on somebody that you should have married stuck on a job that you should have gotten a position that you should have gotten stuck on some offense that you got way back in your childhood and you cannot forget it and you would not move forward. God is saying, today, I want you to take hold of my word. Not a word, a new, different word I'm giving you for tomorrow, but the word that I've spoken. Grab hold of it today. Because it's going to make you ready for tomorrow. If you're here and you're not saved, one word that God has for you. When Jesus came on the scene, it's one word he had for everybody. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. You, you, you're, you're feeling, oh, so fed up of, of life. And if you have the best. You have all that you can want. But yet, there is an emptiness. You need, this, I, there's something I'm missing. I'm telling you that someone is Jesus. And he can satisfy you today if you give him the chance. Stand with me this morning. There is Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 45. He, he addresses a first and a last state. Yeah? There is a first and a last state. He told of a person that came to God, cleaned up his life, and stop there. Didn't eat the food. Didn't, didn't take the words that God spoke to them. 
The state before, they were unsaved. They were separated from God. And then they came to God and God cleaned them up. But they, they stuck there. They didn't take that which God spoke. And he says, the devils came back. And they met a house swept and clean and polished. And they moved in. And not only he moved in, he said, bring your friends. And he says, the last state of the man is worse than the first state. There is a last state. We are we're in the last stages of 2017. You can make the difference. Will your last state be better than your first state? You're probably saying, well, pastor, I've already messed up. I have all those words, I, I just rejected them and I went and I, I, I spoke down the word. I went and spoke to somebody and said, oh, are they not preaching anything? We're not getting any food here. We go, go someplace else. Yes, I heard. I, the stories come back. So if they come to me, they probably come to you too. But I want to tell you, don't worry about that. Today, today is what when, you know, the government, what the government gave us on the, the couple of Mondays ago, the tax day, ABSD free day, remember that? When you can go and shop and discount, today is discount day. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus gave the parable. And learn from this parable. So men went out to work early, sent out his his servant, to look for workers, laborers, brought them in early in the morning, and they came and they worked. Went, went out about midday. They needed some more work. He found some workers to come in and work, and my master will pay you. Went out close. Almost at the end of the day. Almost at the end of the year. And he said, come and work for my father, for my master, and he will pay you. And when all oh, when pay time came, you know what he did, what the master did? Paid everybody the same. Everybody, those who work half an hour, those who work four hours, and those who work eight hours, they got the same pay. Some of them got jealous. I said, that's not fair. Some of us would say that too. Some of us, and somebody who was for the whole year, they were there knocking about. They were there running them out. And they come to us. Some of us witness with it. It's not right. No. God can't forgive them. God shouldn't do it. You don't understand mercy. You don't understand grace. You don't understand God. And the master said, Why are you angry? Why are you vexed? Because I do good. Did I rob you? No. Did I pay you what I said I was going to pay you? Yes. So what's the problem? Whose money is it? Yours. Can I not do with my money that which I please? I decide to bless these men. I bless them. God decides to bless you today. Yeah? Whatever you have done. If you're unsafe and you've done the world of evil, God can change your life today. If you are saved, and look, pastor, I've been, I am, I am one of them. I know some of you might want to come up for that, but don't care. Father, I just say some funny things about the church. I just say some funny things about the word. But I'm telling you, today, God, and you say, God, I receive it, you get full pay. Just like me. Pastor here. So I open the altar for us this morning. God, I want I want full pay today. I may not have worked. I joined the church late. I, I haven't come as often as I know I could. And I say, I know, I know you can't come every service. But those of you, you know you could come more often than you did. But you just decide to slack off. God is saying, today you get full pay. I am going to release upon you 
all that anointing, all that blessing, all that strength, all that courage that I've given through my words throughout the year, I'm going to put it on you today and you'll be ready for tomorrow. So that's my invitation to you today. So if it is you, come and get full pay today. I'm going to pray. You're not saved, you come and somebody will pray to you. But for the rest of us, you want to be packed up with the unsearchable riches of Christ. Come today. I'm going to pray in a while. I'm not going to wait too long. You have to make your decision, make it quick. If the word touch you, you move. If you don't touch you, you'll stay there. It's not for you. We need to, to learn to act decisive. The God, I want it. I want full pay today. I was talking to a friend yesterday, and he told me of a situation where somebody promised them and said, I want to help you all. You come and you tell me your situation, and I will give you up to $30,000 to help your business. And he went, and a couple of his friends went, and they got the money. And the rest of them, who want to go? What do you think they could do? What do you think they do? Oh, I'm going to take money. I'm going to take bribe. I do this. No strings attached. I want the help. And they got the blessing. I tell you today, there's no strings attached. No strings attached here. God just wants to bless you and empower you this morning. Full pay. And you leave here today as charged up as if you've been in every service throughout this year. Father, I give you thanks today. Father, we thank you for 2017. Father, this is a year that will remain in our memory forever. For Father, we should have been destroyed. Not only because of Irma and Marie and the other storm, but Father, you know what we have done. You know what we have said. Lord God, you know but yet you were merciful. You did not destroy. Lord, you had mercy. And we say thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. And Father, now as your servant, Father, I bestow on each person here at this altar with hands raised, my God. Father, Lord God, bestow upon them, my God, the unsearchable riches of your kingdom, my God, the fullness of of your glory and your understanding, my God. Pour it out on them, my God, that they may know you, my God, and the fellowship of your suffering, my God, being made conformable unto your death in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, only you can do it, my God. Father, as our hearts are open before you today, my God, fill our hearts, my God. Fill, Lord God, Father, every longing soul, my God, Father, every heart, Father, that is dissatisfied with their status and their station in life, my God, satisfy them as only you can satisfy. My God, that they leave 2017 with no regrets, my God, but knowing, my God, this morning that they came to you and you, Lord God, fill them with the fullness of God, Father, Lord God, that they are satisfied beyond measure. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. We give you glory. In Jesus' name.